Okay, so the idea is uh, at, in this age of technology, you will hear a lot of a lot of things are happening at the same given time. It's very hard to keep track of all the things. It's they have a, in, in the sci-fi and technology, they have a term called singularity. That is when the innovation happens so fast that you just wouldn't even know what's happening. And, and one of the main reasons why this is happening is because there are so many threads by which development could happen. So at a given time, you hear Elon Musk doing something about uh, batteries and AI at the same time and cars. And, and then you have the blockchain and uh, Bitcoin and all these technologies going on at the same time. Uh, so how do you make sense of all this? Uh, that was kind of my aim here to get an, an overall idea of blockchain with some grounding. So if you hear about something new, you have some framework to make sense of it, especially from a developer point of view. How or why should you learn blockchain development or smart contract development? Uh, what does this buzzword really mean? So <clears throat> smart contract, uh, and this is kind of a dense uh, a, a definition of smart contract, but basically uh, a smart contracts are computer programs which perform computations of some sort and this, the result of this computation allows uh, us to uh, control some real world resource uh, between uh, two or more entities. So uh, we'll see in a more detail how does that actually work out, but uh, uh, I will use a real world example. Um, any computer program, technically, even now, without a non, in a non-blockchain world, can be a smart contract. When you look at eBay, it is kind of a contract. It's computer code which uh, dictates resources provided to you by eBay, it, and it dictates up to some level the money between buyer and the seller and the delivery of product between buyer and seller. Similarly, Uber. Again, driver and the rider. You have something similar going on in there. When you click, uh, when when you click on uh, in Uber the button for uh, you know hailing a, a ride, uh, you kind of commit to a certain uh, contract, Ford and Ford. Uh, and this contract is technically not a legal contract. Uh, the Uber driver, I mean, I don't know the legal uh, you know, understanding of this is. If a, if a driver wanted to take you to court, that you said you wanted to get a car at that point, and uh, you didn't take the car, you were not there. Uh, right now, Uber's code will fine you $5 if you, get, you, know, if you uh, call for a car, and after five minutes, you cancel it. If the driver already starts walking towards you and travel more, travels more than a mile, it will, auto, it will find you if you cancel the, your Uber ride. So in many ways, uh, we are already writing code which behaves as a contract between us. And the reason why we're calling a smart contract because we're doing it with the help of uh, computers. Now, the main thing about, uh, and just, just to be clear, this is similar when you use an app provided to you by your bank. But the way it, uh, it mostly works today is that we need institutions, institution, institutional protections. In the sense, if something wrong happens while you're using your Uber app, uh, if the driver stole your money or you didn't pay or something, you know, there are institutions we built around it, mostly in the form of codes, police, and a bunch of other things, which protect you uh, for this kind of, uh, uh, from this kind of behavior. If your driver doesn't show you, as I, again, I'm not sure if you can take into court or something, but there are still some things involved in there. You can trust Uber to take care of something about it, otherwise you're not gonna give them the business. So again, Uber promises some stuff. If a driver is already driving towards you and you cancel the ride, Uber will charge you $5. And the fun fact is that Uber will give you $5 credit after, for, the, for your next ride. And that is just to ensure that you're not trying to you know, mess with their business. If in your bank account, you open your app, and in a bank account, if you right now see that you have a minus $30,000 balance, so if you had $10,000 and suddenly it says $1, then you know somebody needs to be accountable for that money. You can even take them to some sort of court or something. You don't have to pay the balance. And if you're missing money, you can retrieve it somehow if through FDIC or something else. <clears throat> Smart contracts, in other words, like when we implement contractual obligations through code, uh, they uh, kind of work in a similar way that they use computers to enforce 
private property rights the same way like a fence or a wall or a lock enforces it. I'm, I'm going to use a different example in here. If you have used uh, NJ Transit, how many people have, uh, here have used NJ Transit and MTA? Okay, good enough. Everybody has you. So here's how it works in MTA, uh, uh, NJ Transit. You take a ticket, okay, from a vending machine or paying someone like, you know, at a counter at uh, Penn Station. And then uh, you uh, hop on the train uh, with that ticket and there will be a traveling ticket checker in the train who is going, a conductor who is going to stamp your ticket. And if you don't have the ticket, then he's going to force you to get off at the next station or call the cops if you're not uh, getting off or there's like, you know, any other problem like that. You don't pay, then there is a guy to ensure that you will be held accountable for it. They will somehow going to kick you off the train. MTA works a little bit differently. What they have is a magnetic card and they have this turnstile system where you swipe and then you, will ent you can enter. And if you don't have that card, uh, you cannot really, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, a lot of people jump turnstiles and that's why they have cameras where they find you and the cops go chase you. But there is nobody in the train checking you for your ticket. It's, it's assume, assume that if you're on the train, you pay, you swipe the card in the turnstile and you entered the turnstile from there. So in that example, uh, our current world works like the MTA conduct, uh, NJ Transit conductors and smart contracts would be the equivalent of that turnstile who would let you uh, enter the system once it accepts a payment. It's kind of again a contractual obligation where you have already made the payment of some sort. <coughs> so with the help of blockchain, uh, this, there, there's a missing part in here and that is basically uh, computer programs right now suffer with a big problem and that is when you're running this code on Uber, uh, you are trusting that Uber will take care of the data. If you call the cab, okay, and the cab driver uh, didn't show or something, or you wanted to know the name of the cab driver who was going to, uh, Uber uh, driver who's going to take you to your destination, you rely on the fact that their source code and their computer is doing the proper job. There's a matter of trust. With, in case of Uber, it's not that big of a deal. This, this issue comes in with Yelp ratings. A lot of people are worried about Yelp messing with their ratings. They're, they think that if you are an advertiser, if you're a business and an advertiser on Yelp, you can, uh, they will reduce or remove your negative ratings. And again, Yelp keeps on trying to deal with this problem by giving a message on the screen, that, okay, the businesses cannot pay to remove these ratings. And Yelp is suffering a lot because of that. I don't trust them too much. I go to a restaurant, restaurant turns out to be terrible, then I come back and it's like, well, they had great Yelp rating. I don't understand how this is possible. They must have paid Yelp or something like that. So blockchain is essentially a mechanism by which we can create, by, with the help of uh, uh, the, the tools available to us, a more trusted execution of the code. This, on an abstract level, because I'm going to go deeper into the, the, the lower level, but on an abstract level, it makes the contractual clause unnecessary. So when you run your code of Yelp onto the blockchain, it is like they have signed a legal agreement that, uh, that which you don't need to like, you know, uh, worry about it, but you can verify it at any time. It's like a legal agreement that they are not going to modify any ratings. Right now, Yelp has no legal obligation as such. And yeah, this is why Yelp just suffers to just try to convince you that they're not modifying the uh, code uh, ratings. So now we'll, we'll look a bit deeper into what blockchain really is. <clears throat> so on a fundamental level, blockchain is nothing but a data structure. That's most, you know, from a computer science point of view, that's how you can understand it as. Uh, it's just like a data structure like strings, hashing, uh, integers, uh, time travel, I don't know why that is there, but uh, tuple, stack, uh, it's a special kind of data structure. Uh, it, ha it is also like, you know, the three major attributes of this is that it's a cryptographically verifiable st uh, data structure. That means there is, um, uh, by, with the help of uh, uh, cryptography, there is a certain control of who enters the information in it and who, you know, who can modify it and anybody can read it. And similarly, data is stored in terms of blocks where the subsequent changes to the data structure are also recorded. So there is a huge log of any change made to that data structure. And finally, these blocks are connected through the checksum, which is 
uh, again, I'm not going to go into that aspect of it. But again, use cryptography, mathematical magic, it connects all these blocks to each other. So you end up getting uh, an original piece of information followed by any changes made to that piece of information and all verifiable with the help of, uh, all verifiable with the help of uh, uh, cryptography. So the easiest thing to create in there, and that was the biggest experiment which was done in there, is to create a ledger where what we do is we have uh, the, our original state is an array, and then we store subsequent changes made to that array. So they created Bitcoin, which was created in 2009 by somebody named Satoshi Nakamoto. You might, uh, uh, this is a very popular uh, product. Um, and blockchain, it, what they did was they implemented the simplest thing, and that is a ledger. It's a ledger of transactions on the blockchain. So what does these numbers represent? Well, they call them Bitcoins and people treat them like a currency. But at the end of the day, these are just a list of numbers and balances. Uh, this is where we see in, in my earlier slide when I showed you uh, this, uh, this screen uh, that it controls something real in the, uh, in the real world. And, and in blockchain, in Bitcoin, we are controlling money. In the sense, the thing which we are now securing with the help of this special data structure is this virtual currency called Bitcoin. Uh, that brings us <coughs> to something interesting, which happened around three years ago. Why should we stop at storing just transactions? And just to be clear, banks are very excited about Bitcoin because they feel that using this data structure, not only they can store like this virtual money, which they're less interested in, but they want to store like uh, real estate deeds and like you know and, and financial assets and perform uh, the, you know things on the top of it, uh, keep a record of all these things and have some sort of mathematical verifiability. Right now, if you purchase a property in uh, America, you need to get a title insurance, and this is an insurance against the the security that. Maybe somebody else comes tomorrow and he says that I owned a property which somebody else falsely sold to somebody else who then sold it to you. Technically, you don't own that property. And this is what title insurance prevents you against. If we have the real estate transactions and deeds be recorded on the blockchain, then tech, something like this would not be needed. Again, this is not the best example. There are much, uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Right. Ba banks have a huge, uh, like these uh, layers and layers of redundancies to ensure that they're keeping your money and your assets safe. And this is where, this is why they're so excited about it because they can now uh, uh, use the blockchain to do other things. But what, what I'm trying to show here is that in 2013, uh, people started to think other uses of Bitcoin and they thought, okay, it's fine that we can store a ledger on it, balances and balances of all these things, uh, but why stop at storing just balances of a virtual currency? What they saw is that at the end of the day, a computer is nothing but like a fine, something, you know, in computer science we started to get it's a finite state machine. For, for, for people, uh, uh, just to have a simpler understanding of this is, a computer is a state machine where every transaction, we can describe the whole runtime of a computer as a sequence of state transformation functions. And because we have this, this is why you can put your computer to sleep and unplug it and turn the battery out, you know, if it if it's go, goes into hibernate, and then you can turn it back on, you can get where, where you were. Uh, unlike a television, which is not a state-based machine. If you turn it off, you're not gonna get your data out of it, okay? You, it will not start where you stopped it. So, this is why they came up with this idea that how about instead of storing the ledger, let's store a full computer on the blockchain. We start with the original state of a computer, uh, and then any changes made through in the computer state with the help of a uh, transaction, we store the history of the whole thing on the blockchain. And that's when they came up with the idea of uh, Ethereum, where uh, Ethereum is the name of the product, where what they did was they created a virtual machine whose states, uh, the whole state uh, of anything is stored on the blockchain itself. 
So they started out from the, from the perspective of architecture is to create their own bytecode. Just to give you an idea, this is how we have previously done other things like Java. In Java Virtual Machine, uh, we saw this problem because we were writing code for various different architectures and running, a, you know, you're generating a file for Mac OS, for PowerPC, for something else, and Linux. And then uh, somebody wrote a JVM. Let's imagine a virtual machine on which everybody writes a code for this machine and they will take care of the implementation detail. So a layer of abstraction. So something similar to that, uh, as you can see, there is a, a stop instruction, add, multiply, subtract. Um, this is very similar to an 8086 uh, uh, instruction set from the 1980s. It's like an earlier computer, which they have implemented on the blockchain. And the implications are huge. So to start with, uh, if you wrote a program for this uh, 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 virtual machine, you can benefit uh, the, this trusted execution space. So because you have here a virtual machine uh, uh, assembly language, we can now build programming languages, higher level programming languages on the top of it. So the most popular one, the most the officially supported one with the most amount of development is called Solidity. And this is where I like recommend if you want to get into blockchain development, that's what you would be doing, learning Solidity. Uh, the code looks very similar to C. Uh, it is, uh, as you can see, uh, instead of using class, we have contract. I I'm going to use a simpler example here. Uh, uh, what this means is that you can right now create, well, in this example, I'm like creating an unsigned integer A. I'm just giving it a value of zero. Uh, this looks very similar to uh, like uh, object-oriented code, except for class keyword, we have contract keyword. And my class name is a really terrible A, but... Uh, and then I created a, a data member, followed by uh, a method which I added to that contract called increment A. Now, uh, and all it does is A++. Again, this is uh, simple programming. This is very familiar syntax. Even JavaScript developers would know something like this. And if you were to deploy this code on the blockchain, onto this virtual uh, uh, machine, it will run forever. And anybody can trigger this method, uh, increment A, by interacting with the blockchain. And if somebody triggers it and the value of A goes to one, now that means in a trusted manner, anybody else can know that the, uh, this was executed once and on a certain point, and this is what really happened to it. So, uh, in addition to that, what we can also do is what, I, what I've done is I've written a little bit more code in here. I created a new data type here. This is a data type in native to Solidity called address, and I stored owner in it. And this is a constructor. Again, you can see uh, familiar patterns in here. Um, I'm storing the person who deploys this code into the owner uh, variable. And uh, when the increment A is being triggered, what I'm doing is if message to sender equal to equal to owner, then A plus plus. The whole idea here in this code is if the person who deploys, only that person can trigger this. So this is some sort of access control uh, in, this, uh, in this code where uh, this allows you to do a bunch of things. Imagine if you implemented Uber onto blockchain, you will get some benefits where basically the, they will, you will store the information of the driver and the rider and then you will connect them and this will all be done on a blockchain. Again, on Yelp it might make more sense that if a business uh, acknowledges you as a customer by accepting your money on the blockchain, so now you know that this person was definitely the, went to that restaurant and paid $30 worth of uh, money and now when that person writes a review, you know that there is some legitimacy to that review. And then at the same time, because a lot of people, a lot of times, which happens in Yelp, where uh, opposing businesses write bad reviews to their com competitors' uh, 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 you know, Yelp page. So you can do things like these in here. And what it's, what it's really doing is for, for a front-end developer, for us, for tech, uh, people in technology, that it's transforming the, the whole stack. Uh, until now, we have a front end and a back end uh, where front end is generally in either HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or 
mobile platforms like Objective C or something like that, which you can still do. Okay, I'm just focusing on the web application development, and the backend remains solely in Solidity, and it runs on the blockchain itself. And this programming language is still being built, uh, Solidity, and the blockchain is Ethereum is still having uh, going through some active development. But the idea still remains that if you if from a front-end developer's perspective, you can now, with a very little effort, get into uh, uh, the full stack of blockchain development. And uh, uh, still, front-end code makes a huge part of it. I have written Solidity code, fully functional working Solidity code, in a meeting where they said, can you write us this code? And I wrote in like 10 minutes or 15, 20 minutes. It's super simple because the whole idea is you only put the most important part of your business logic onto that uh, blockchain. You don't want to put everything in there. So if you had a video rendering service, you're not going to put that code, uh, uh, you know, your rendering logic onto the blockchain because it does not require trusted execution. However, the order process and the delivery of the video file, you can that you can put that onto that server. YouTube, something similar, you know. Uh, but somebody has created an application as a proof of concept that uh, YouTube has a concept of uh, pa patronage, uh, like, you know, if I will sponsor your show, but I now pay you $100 for that episode for producing it, but if it goes uh, above 2,000 views, then I'm gonna pay you additional $1,000, like a bonus or referral, like, you know, a commission. So something like this could be implemented on blockchain, and again, it does not require the trust of the individuals. So in future, when we are going to do more development of uh, 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 applic web applications and computer software, we'll find out that more and more companies where the purpose of business and institution is just to provide a fail-safe layer is being incrementally being moved on to the blockchain. And that brings me to an uh, interesting topic. A lot of people have been asking about uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I would consider the AI, and by that I mean machine learning, but AI and machine learning, lab of programming, to be the one leg of things where humanity is offloading some of the tasks we do onto a computer. Uh, if somebody has to stand here and keep an eye out for anybody who does not look like he belongs to this place, then we have to put a person in there. We imagine that we can, if you were to do a machine learning program to this, we can train people to have some sort of uh, you know suspicious behavior detection, uh, fraud detection, and those kind of things. People people's fantasies run wild when it comes to AI. But then there is still an, another leg of this future over technology, and that is the trust part. Uh, you created uh, an AI, but where is it being executed? In fact, a lot of a big question which was being raised in front of Elon Musk, he created an organization called OpenAI, and the biggest question which is being asked in front of him is, uh, do you think AI will take over the world or something like that? Do you think humanity will have a problem? And this is the kind of things what we're trying to do. If, for now, we will see that we are moving our banks, instead of trusting our banks to hold our money, we are trusting, uh, we are forcing them, or like, you know, demanding uh, that they put their transactions and their process on the blockchain. So at any given time, with the help of mathematical cryptographic verifiability, we can know that you are not messing with, with this. Then we can trust them. Something similar can be expected out of AI too. AI will have a similar burden on, on their head that I can now trust the AI because I know that this AI is going to uh, be committing, it's, it's going to prove itself by interacting on the blockchain. And I have a way of knowing this because I know no computer is fast enough to be able to break this blockchain security model. So uh, this is why uh, it, you know a lot of people, can, like, in terms of imagination, a lot of people see how AI is going to go there, but I believe AI is still, uh, uh, like even machine learning has there's a long way to go. We are seeing a lot of progress, but on the other hand, uh, we are building trustless systems. So on one hand, we are giving critical responsibilities to the machines, but at the same time, we are trying to create uh, a system where we do not have to uh, uh, trust the machines uh, uh, that much, or trust the individuals that much. And, and basically, that's the 
end of like you know that, that's the overall gist of this whole technology paradigm is. Uh, I wanted to show you after this uh, um, a bit to see how can you get started in the uh, blockchain development. But if you guys have any questions about this part, what I mentioned about blockchain in general before we move on to the next part, go ahead. Sure. So did I understand you to say with the Ethereum blockchain that if you publish a method to the Ethereum blockchain that anybody can call it, meaning anybody's sure. with an internet connection, basically. And so therefore, is, the, is smart contracts essentially creating a, a vast live code library? Yes, uh, of course, uh, you know, as in my example, when I uh, kind of showed here, uh, like in this example, I, I made sure that only this person, only the person who originally deployed it can trigger this method. So, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure if, if that's the direction you wanted to go, but, but, but it is true that in future, we'll have a distributed network of code snippets programs living all over and we will be interacting them but then this is kind of like see internet is the same thing internet is the same thing when you have all these servers and computers and like you know there's software running in this uh, computer in this projector right now doing the job uh, of some sort so I guess it's the same thing except yes it would be a giant network of code interacting with each other and interacting with individuals um. Sure. Why do you need um, an instruction set as part of this blockchain? Why it's not just used for like state keeping the slow scratch? Sure. Like it's kind of like. Why not just have an API? Well, not even an API, basically. Like, there are lots of programming that is out there, and a lot of which have state like verification. Why don't we need a new VM to run this on? Because, for instance, in terms of like pushing this through, I can write a password and then it's going to push it through here. And then just dump the state out of this. Right. And I don't understand why I need a whole set of new language features on this. So Ethereum uh, <coughs> built like this, okay? And that's what all their aim is. And I would say the answer is simply software architecture. Uh, in terms of software architecture and security, Creating an advanced, more difficult and complicated uh, API is more difficult than uh, managing something very simple like this. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities possible with this VM. You can build other things on the top of it and they don't wanna run behind. They're going as far as they can go in terms of abstraction layer so that in tomorrow something new comes up they don't have to, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't have to ditch the Ethereum of uh, the software or code written for Ethereum. Which is why this is right now uh, one of the most dominant uh, paradigms. Other companies are trying to build competing blockchain solutions with modifications. But because of this virtual machine standards, all they're trying to do is to change the implementation of the blockchain underneath it. So tomorrow, if... Uh, quantum computers, you know, computing comes around uh, and this creates a problem for the security of the big uh, Ethereum uh, and, and then you have to modify the whole thing, you can re-implement this virtual machine uh, uh, set onto that new architecture. And that's one of the reasons why they, they went for this kind of approach. On the top of that, if tomorrow new programming language comes around, are you really going to build a new, like, you know, if, if you're saying right now you can have Haskell, say, say they just build RPC or something, you know, they, they have just have endpoint, API endpoints. But the whole point is, uh, right now, this is, I would just say, it's a good software architecture approach they utilize to go for the most common, uh, you know, the, 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 the highest level, the lowest level of abstraction, which is just, imagine if this was a machine, and this is, what would you build on the top of it? And also, it's my understanding that, like, they, you can monitor every process they so the way Ethereum is implemented, there's one aspect which I didn't mention, and that is that the, the concept of gas. So they imagine the whole of fees would be, could be set the same way. So if someone wants to uh, run this code, 
uh, this is a, a simple storage contract. You, you call this method and will store this value for you inside the contract, and then you call this method get. You get the value back, simple set and get. Uh, again, if you want to run uh, the set method, because you're modifying the blockchain and you're storing a new piece of information, you need to pay it. Uh, you, know, you need to pay a certain amount of fee to, to uh, incentivize people to run this code and do a bunch of things with it. So, so that's what he kind of uh, alluded to. Uh, the read operations are free because you can just get a copy of the uh, machine and just execute it yourself. But write operations are super expensive because they have to go and propagate to every, everybody else. Uh, and again, the benefit you're gonna get is uh, if, if there is any changes made to this value, you will have the complete log of everything stored in a decentralized manner. But again, I, I, I just want to find out like, you know, if that actually answered the question you were interested in. Well, I think you, you, you kind of described two separate problems. But I'm saying before, we have you say that the client state machine that should be the same way that we're talking about state. And the reason I brought up Haskell is it's an inherent state. Like sure. And so using blockchain to manage that state and keep a record of those changes seems like that would be are you contrasting solidity with Haskell? Like, why do you have to be so yeah. So I think that is, there are primitives in solidity that has to do with like financial things, like contracts, I think there's auction, and there's like, there's other things there, that- There are cryptographic- uh, well, I, I, That's what I was talking about the morning, is the reason why you're using solidity here, because it's, it gives you that basically the cryptographic uh, okay, okay, I see what your question is, okay. So, I just don't get why I need a whole new language when I can modify the data structure. And because you could take Haskell and compile that to the same byte code problem. Right, right, yeah, so so the main thing is, do you understand why the VM by assembly level yeah. byte code is, okay. Uh, now, so the, on the top of that, uh, the most popular language, the flavor is C and Java and JavaScript, they all belong to a similar family. So, they created this. Uh, you are free to build a Haskell, uh, uh, you know, code base for it. And again, and, and this code gets compiled into the bytecode and it lives on the blockchain as a bytecode. So the compatibility issue is the main thing is the bytecode part. So uh, you can write a Haskell code. They have functional programming languages uh, like a, a Lisp, uh, 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 like flavor. They call it LLL. Uh, and go ahead. I don't want to say that. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but, but, that's, but that's the idea. So what I'm going to do is... Sure, go ahead. So when you create a contract, uh -huh. that contract becomes public. Is that correct? Contract becomes what? It becomes like a public thing. Yes. Is the code public or like the, the class definition or contract definition signature is public? So Sig like okay. Hash. Right. Signature is public. There's like a JSON, uh, like you know, there's like an endpoints are public, so that like you know, people can easily find out if uh, uh, like you know what methods are available. So anybody can see increment is available. The implementation details are inside this virtual machine code, the bytecode. So unless you use reverse compilation or something, you're not gonna get the original source code out of it. The question I had is that mm -hmm. I see that through a check to see if message uh, that send a variable to Right. What would I get? Oh, that was, so the message of sender is provided to you by the by uh, the Solidity. Uh, so basically, when you interact with it, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine will provide you uh, with some data object. So what they've done is uh, they've created a, 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 a JavaScript bindings for the for core interactions of. Uh, I'm going to drop this here. Uh, web three JS. Okay. Uh, Okay, so they have created a, a, a JavaScript library which provides uh, a bunch of common methods uh, available. Yeah, okay. So a bunch of common methods available on the Ethereum blockchain. So the easiest way to interact with the Ethereum blockchain is to use their JavaScript API. Now underneath it, one of the implementation is done in RPC uh, uh, for, for this stuff. It's done through RPC calls. So they have created this web3.js library and the message.sender, it's like the RPC, uh, uh, Ethereum natively <coughs> implements RPC and it provides you with an object which web3.js converts into a message object which has the amount of uh, ether sent with it 
and the sender information and when it was sent and the block it was sent in and a whole bunch of things. So I'm using this externally injected object called message and finding out the sender information from it. The question I have is this, right? An example of it, it's like web 3 to get block. Get block. Uh -huh. you have a number. Right, so it will give you the 48 block. Blocks of, what? of the Ethereum blockchain, which is it connected to? So, what if, so what if I wanted to verify the same transaction? Okay, so uh, it, it here I would say there is transaction API. Well, get block transa get transaction, and then you get oh. you provide with the hash of the transaction, and you return you the details of the transaction. That's why I was confused because I thought that the contract was a hash, or the transaction is a hash, and then the, the transaction, transaction name is a hash. But yeah, but but the but the contract has an address now. So contract becomes like an account, uh, and it lives at a certain location. Now, what I wanted to do is to uh, introduce you guys to uh, Truffle uh, library, which is basically, uh, uh, it's, like a, it's like React boilerplate. Uh, it has uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, it's a development framework. Uh, it has a bunch of things done for you, including a very easy to use JavaScript abstraction layer called Ether Putting. Uh, again, I will uh, try to show you with this. It has ES6 support, JavaScript. Uh, I am going to, what I'm going to do is, uh, okay, so, this is, hold on. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. It is, is it because ah, I see that's what's going on. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make reference. I'm gonna... it's easier for me to deal with. Okay, so. Let me know if uh, the, the transparency is kind of, uh, okay. So, uh, so Truffle has uh, a bunch of commands available for you. It's, it has a build tool called Truffle. Uh, I'm just going to run a Truffle in it. And what it does is it generates, uh, uh, I just created a new directory there. And uh, it jumped, can you guys see this? Let, let me know, I'm gonna, is this good enough? Okay. So it creates a, a, a bunch of uh, tools for you. It, you can install uh, NPM pack, you know, you can manage this whole thing with NPM too. But what it does is, um, what, what we need is that once we generate a project, what we need is we need to connect it to a certain uh, blockchain. So right now, what is the easiest blockchain available is uh, called TestRPC. It's like for, it's basically a virtual blockchain. It does do things pretty well, but I would recommend installing this. And again, its installation is NPM based. Uh, and if once you run this, so in here, I'm gonna run here TestRPC app. I've have it installed, and I don't wanna run the install, come on. Uh, Okay. Ah, because I have something like this already running here. Yes. Okay, that's a problem. Yes. Uh, so, test RPC, if I run it here, it will generate. Um, a bunch of accounts for you to use, a uh, private bunch of private keys, and give you a sample uh, HD wallet. Again, I didn't I didn't use that, but the whole idea is uh, this is the fastest way to do development instead of running the whole Ethereum blockchain. Again, I have not shown you how to run the Ethereum blockchain. That is a whole other thing out of the scope of this talk. But I would say you can do most of your development with the help of Test RPC. So, what really happens is uh, when you run Truffle. Uh, build, uh, it's, it has a bunch of commands in there. Uh, one of the best things it does is uh, once you run Truffle compile, it will compile your contracts into it. Right now, I just created a demo contract. 
which I'm going to show you in a minute. But the whole idea is you can do truffle serve and it will run a development server for you. If you make any modifications into the code, uh, you will, I'm going to just open this here. Okay, so this is an example of uh, a Solidity contract, which is, again, I, I skipped a bunch of steps in here. Again, it's simple, just like any command line tool. But the whole idea is, this is again an example of a contract. I'm gonna make it bigger if, okay. Okay, so this is uh, again a contract. It has three, fun four functions. One of them is just a constructor. Uh, and then it has send coin, get balance in turn, and get balance. What this is, uh, once you run that command in, uh, in uh, Truffle, on the local host 8086, you will see this. Uh, it's a simple HTML CSS application. I'm going to show you how to actually interact with this contract. But the way it works is this. Um, what I'm going to do is, yeah, the, the way they're implemented is, uh, I'm just going to copy one account. And uh, let's see. It has, I'm going to send 10, uh, it, it creates a virtual uh, coin called MetaCoin. And in the contract, what it's doing is it creates a hash map. Again, this is a bit, a bit you might not have seen in other languages for mapping. Uh, this is the data type of the key. This is the data type of the value. This is the name of the array, uh, hash map. And then here it says balances tx or dot origin. Again, transaction tx object is injected into there to give you some information, some of the basic things which uh, tries to help you with. I ask you to assign it uh, 666. Uh, what do you call, uh, 666 initial balance to the person who deploys this contract. So if I were to deploy this contract, I start with a balance of 666. Then I can run this method called SendCoin, provide anybody else's address on the Ethereum blockchain, and they will now have, uh, once you run this balance, it first checks if you have that balance or not. And then it, it, it reduces your balance, and it increments uh, the balance of uh, 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 you know the person you send the money to, and then it becomes true. Again, you can call this method and see the balance. Uh, I have not. Uh, let's see. It will compile. It will deploy because I saved it, and you will see here some other information being displayed. And when you refresh it, you will see six 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 balance. Again, to just show you, if I were to modify this to ten thousand thousand. It will compile, deploy, and then you will get 10,000. Now, if you were to send this to somebody else, which I copied it earlier, uh, send MetaCoin, and you can see now my balance is 300. And again, this is persistent into the blockchain. Uh, and. Uh, this, if by using real, if you were to create a real application like this and deploy it in the blockchain, you will get uh, 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 real uh, persistence on that layer. And finally, I just wanted to show, uh, to see how to actually interact with this coin, so uh, with this contract. So uh, what, uh, yeah, so what uh, Truffle does for you is it creates a binding JavaScript binding of all the, uh, the methods you wrote here uh, and creates them uh, if you want to use them in a certain manner. So for example, send coin. This is how you use them. Uh, you start with saying metacoin uh, dot deployed because your contract needs to be deployed somewhere. Um, it gets some value. This is simple JavaScript code. And then this is what you do. Meta dot send coin. This is the name of that method you're calling. And then you have to specify a certain amount of money you want to send with it to whom you're sending, and the, the arguments of that method. And this is what uh, this application uses to do get balance to fetch this. And then when you press send coin method, it does the same transaction for you. Uh, if you were to switch uh, the contracts, which this application doesn't allow you to do, you will see his balance go up by 700 meta points. Again, uh, I know this might be a little bit too much with this part, but the whole idea is, I would recommend try looking at sample uh, uh, contracts on Solidity uh, uh, documentation. Uh, 
and it will it has a bunch of examples it tries to teach you by example like you can create a voting contract out of this where uh, there's a ballot and people can vote people can delegate their vote to other people uh, you can create an organization contract where basically I can give my uh, my companies uh, if I'm the founder of the company then I allow the CEO to spend say ten thousand dollar every day and if he wants to spend anything more than that then he needs the permission from other people so again it works like store the address of the chairperson store the address of uh, accountant and other people and the possibilities are endless that's what I'm gonna say not to uh, uh, drown you too much in, uh, in information in here but it's a fascinating world but check out solidity development check out truffle and you can start writing your uh, your smart contract applications hopefully in future there'll be like full-time jobs like a smart contract writer which is as there are a few jobs like that by the way you know if you if you, if you want to become world's first smart contract writer I think position is still open Okay. So how do you deploy the Okay, so the deployment is right now, uh, as I said, web, web3.js. Uh, web3.js has uh, the API call for it. But right now, this one is, uh, Truffle allows you to easily deploy it by specifying the address of the server. And uh, so most of the things you control in Truffle is with the help of... Uh, Okay, so most of the things you, you, you uh, run it with the help of this. It, the easiest way to manage this is to modify uh, this to where your local blockchain is sitting. Right now, I ran TestRBC, which is just an in-memory blockchain uh, software. So, so you made your local blockchain? So, so yeah, you've run a node, and then uh, the, you connect it to the rest of the blockchain. You synchronize your node with the rest of the blockchain, and uh, then this will do the deployment for you. Of course, you need to send, spend a certain amount of money to deploy it on the live blockchain, uh, which is not much right now, but in future it could be a lot more. Like, you know, so right now I would say you would spend, to deploy that Metacoin contract, I guess you will have to spend like 25 cents to deploy it. <laughs> so, because it is now available to anybody. And then to call this method, I guess you have to spend like, you know, 0.5 cents or something, 0.0, uh, you know, something like that. These would be free. Questions? All right. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So, I guess. Go ahead. I guess the idea is that to have open governance. Uh -huh. Open what? Documents? Open, no, open governance. Okay. Open governance, yes. Uh, people are, uh, people's imagination is running wild. They want to create uh, uh, basic income schemes on it, uh, open governance. Right now, they're trying to uh, uh, create a system by which you can run your company with the help of, well, that's the, the, the corporate governance to run on this. To have their accounting go onto the blockchain, they're calling it triple entry accounting. Uh, personally, I'm interested in arbitration go there, uh, you know, so pe when people have conflicts on issues, they can resolve it on the blockchain. Uh, so yeah, open governance is one of the things. Um, there, is, there are many interesting, um, like, tools being built on the top of it. One of them is uh, Backfeed where they're trying to create a uh, corporate governance for decentralized organization. Uh, again, you check it out, they also run a magazine on it. <laughs> Facebook owned by the users. Right now, T-Mobile sent out an email to everybody that uh, if you want, if you're a T-Mobile customer, they will give you one share of T-Mobile for free. Uh, I just got that email today, like, you know, and uh, it's something similar going on in a bunch of other places, crowdfunding. Then we have Augur, uh, which is, uh, decentralized prediction market where what they really want to do is they want to create forecasting prediction markets on the top of blockchain so right now there are various prediction markets which where you can bet money that if you think the outcome of a certain it will Britain exit the EU or not there is a certain amount of money going on in there they're trying to build the third part the, the decentralized version of it 
and it could be huge because right now there are many restrictions on how much money can you bet. It's not legal to in America to bet on prediction markets for more than eight hundred dollars. Uh, in Europe, in Britain, it's legal, so that's why you have to go to British sites to do this. But this will enable a lot more real money going into the thing. Uh, their whole code is written in React and Redux. Um, and uh, uh, you can definitely check it out. It's one of the, one of the most sophisticated uh, React app, open source React applications I've seen. Uh, and uh, uh, again, Ethereum at the back end. Uh, so uh, it's open source. So that's another one of interesting projects to see. And then finally, we have uh, DAO, <laughs> which you might have heard of it. Uh, they created a decentralized fund, uh, uh, a smart contract, but you can put money in there. And uh, uh, they, you can then vote by the amount of uh, you know, the money you inv invested on various proposals. So this was, they ran a, a blockchain, uh, what do you call it, a 30-day crowd sale. And it became mega popular. It was on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, they raised $150 million. <coughs> and the largest crowdfunding event of all times. So right now, just because the, the, the amount of uh, Ether went up, so they have $225 million with them. And if you look at DAO.report, you can see uh, some very interesting proposals going in. You can vote for them. Again, you need to have some DAO tokens there. So people invested a lot of money in there. Uh, some of them very interesting, you know, the, the, none of them are passing right now. There are a bunch of issues involved in there. But again, this whole source code is free. Uh, not this specific front end. They don't have any front end code except for individual code written by people. But uh, uh, you can check it out. And uh, right now, people are excited to see how the government reacts to 150 or 200 million dollars of money going in investing in projects. And God knows what kind of projects they're going to invest in. Like, like somebody put a proposal. Would you like to contribute to a collaborative online music uh, <laughs> thing? That's kind of funny, but yeah. Ethereum uh, currently is leading into this uh, uh, the blockchain field development. By the way, you guys, you know, you guys can walk around, have, have more food or something. You know, <laughs> you're not tied down here. And I'm I'm gonna be here if if you want to talk to me or something. But. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.